the advantage of uh, speaking the very last um, in a, a day like this is that all of the uh, truly complicated and complex issues have already been dealt with. Um, and you'll see uh, some recapitulation of many of the themes that you've heard about through the day. The liability of uh, going last, of course, is that pretty much everything that needed to be said has been said. Um, I am going to cope with that by uh, trying to give you a slightly different frame of reference for uh, the work that you've heard today that involves a kind of uh, synthesis, a kind of convergence that Clyde and I realized that we were coming to uh, in that last uh, year of his life. And I'd like to just share that convergence with you uh, for your consideration as a way of, uh, in some way, making sense of all of these data um, that have been so compellingly uh, presented today. So uh, the title um, that I chose was uh, From Science to Action, Clyde Hertzman's Vision for a More Just and Generous World. Clyde was um, a tremendous advocate for social justice, for uh, generosity on the part of human societies, and it's uh, truly an honor to present a lecture um, in his name. So in, in my brief remarks this morning, I mentioned that Bob Evans had uh, said that Clyde's philosophy really could be summarized in seven words, which is, uh, it doesn't have to be this way. He, he would have argued that it doesn't have to be that 14 to 24 percent of North American children live in poverty. He would have argued that 10 and a half million of the world's children uh, having to die from preventable diseases each year before they're five years old doesn't have to be. He would have argued that it is completely unacceptable that two million children are exploited each year in the global commercial sex trade. And he would have said that it doesn't have to be that children from disadvantaged communities sustain higher levels of toxic stress, virtually every form of human malady and premature mortality. Um, it just doesn't have to be. There are things that we can do about uh, each of those. So Clyde's work and mine uh, began to uh, intermingle and converge in this decade from 2003 to 2013. I had the great, great good fortune of spending seven years uh, at the University of British Columbia. And believe me, David, I am not gone. I have a footprint securely planted in Vancouver and, and hope I will uh, forever hence. So I would like to argue that, that these two sets of works, uh, Clyde's social epidemiology and my work in uh, developmental pediatrics, uh, resulted in a convergence on a novel hypothesis which we believed had implications for population health and social policy. So let's start with Clyde's work. His work really began, and Arjuman uh, this morning alluded to this work, with uh, observations about the health crisis in Eastern uh, Europe in the decades following the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the disappearance of communism, and the, really the blighted societies that were left uh, in the wake of those uh, political events. This was the kind of, uh, of uh, association that he was uh, particularly interested in when he looked at temporal trends in male cardiovascular mortality in Eastern versus Western Europe in the, this three decades beginning in 1960. What he noted uh, cogently was that in Western Europe there was this uniform decline in cardiovascular uh, mortality among men uh, living in the countries of, of Western Europe. And this was true for uh, 45 to 64 year old men, for 65 to 74 year old men, and in each of these uh, uh, time periods for both. And in contrast to that, those living in uh, Eastern Europe had not just smaller uh, declines in cardiovascular mortality, but actually increases in cardiovascular mortality uh, over the same uh, time period. Here was a, 
compelling, interesting uh, natural experiment that demanded uh, an answer for why this was happening. The answer that uh, Clyde came to, along with uh, students and trainees and colleagues like Argeman, uh, was that this had to do with swift economic and political transformation, with an economic decline that was happening in Eastern Europe, with increasing disparities in income distributions, and with distrust for civil institutions. Uh, a constellation of uh, conditions that sounds remarkably like the United States, now that I think about it um, at, at the moment. Um, but this was all then in the same spirit as this iconic work of Michael Marmot and his colleagues uh, in the Whitehall Studies of Socioeconomic Status and Health, which as he and others demonstrated earlier today, was this uh, clear grady gradient, a stepwise increase in mortality rates within the British uh, civil servants, uh, depending upon the class of, uh, of civil service um, categorization that they were in. This is a fundamental observation that has uh, transformed the way that we think about uh, social determinants of health. It is a, an association that is so powerful that we don't believe any other association without first controlling for social class, and yet we never really studied it as a phenomenon in itself until about 20, 30 uh, years ago. An interesting thing happened then in this, these early years of Clyde's career. This is a plot of Clyde Hertzman papers in referee journals from 1983 to 2013. And first thing I want you to notice is this colossal increase in uh, scholarly productivity that continued throughout the 30 years of his uh, academic life. But the interesting thing was that there was a point in time right here in 19. 94, uh, when he published a paper by the title, The Lifelong Impact of Childhood Experiences, a Population Health Perspective in Daedalus in, in uh, 1994. And beginning at that point, there was this really exponential increase in the proportion of his papers uh, that were child-oriented, um, that, were, that were focused on uh, the uh, conditions of children, conditions of childhood, and their implications for not only concurrent health and development within childhood, but their long-term implications as well for uh, uh, health and development uh, over the life course. So there was this inflection point when suddenly, and if you go back and read uh, these papers that immediately preceded that, there's very little mention of childhood. It's really quite interesting. Uh, this sort of spontaneously generated, and suddenly, with this Daedalus article, he is talking and talking eloquently and profoundly about the importance uh, of early childhood. Now, why would that have happened? Well, I think these are some of the things that had caught Clyde's attention. The first was this fundamental observation of David Barker uh, that appeared, um, one article was in 1989 in The Lancet, which related uh, has, uh, the hazard ratio for coronary heart disease uh, death rates before age 65 to birth weight, uh, obviously decades uh, earlier in the life course. And he showed that children who were born uh, underweight uh, and in a graded association had a systematically higher rate of cardiovascular disease and uh, actually coronary heart disease mortality uh, than those who were born of normal uh, birth weight. So the first glimmer of this implication that something that's happening in early childhood is having effects decades later on cardiovascular risk in the lives of uh, these individuals. Secondly, he was uh, fascinated to find that the gradient that had been identified in the British civil servants by Michael Marmot and others uh, was replicated uh, clearly in the uh, relationship between socioeconomic status and child health within childhood populations. So here is uh, work from Edith Chen uh, plotting any limiting chronic uh, pediatric condition, ear disease, physical inactivity, asthma, and injury as a function of uh, socioeconomic status going from low on the left side to high uh, on the right side. And again, 
the Michael Marmot uh, graded association, not what Clyde would have called a hockey stick, but rather a, a linear monotonic association across the full range of, of socioeconomic uh, status. And third, he was increasingly impressed with the evidence for a kind of biological embedding uh, of societal influences on child health and development. And he was fond of talking about how social signal transduction conducted this kind of archaeology that began with uh, the social and lived experience of a child that was then underpinned by uh, the neural circuitry that underpins behavior, experience, emotion. That was then underpinned by differences in functioning at the level of neurons and synapses, and that in turn was underpinned by differences in, uh, in genes and uh, epigenetic uh, modifications. So there was this emerging literature uh, that suggested that childhood experiences were important not only for childhood but for distant adult health, that they were biologically embedded, and uh, he suddenly, really, began to pursue this with all of the vigor that Clyde uh, was known for. Now, I want to remind you at this juncture here uh, of this classic, uh, truly wonderful paper by Jeffrey Rose that appeared in the International Journal of Epidemiology in 1985. It was titled Sick Individuals and Sick Populations. And what Rose called to our attention was that there, is a, there are differences between thinking about disease or development at the level of individuals versus the level of populations. He pointed out that one kind of question uh, to ask is, why do some individuals have uh, higher blood pressures than others? These are, again, London civil servants, this nice Gaussian distribution of blood pressure. But another kind of question was uh, a quite, a, quite a different uh, sort of question. Why is blood pressure higher in some populations, such as London civil servants, than in other populations, like Kenyan uh, nomads? So two fundamentally different kinds of questions. Now clearly, the Hertzman kind of question was the latter. Clyde was fundamentally interested in differences between populations and why those differences occurred, where they came from, their etiology, their origins. The other type of question, uh, why do some individuals have higher blood pressure than others, is a voice kind of question, uh, because I have been uh, fundamentally interested in the breadth of these kinds of distributions of biological phenomena and why they differ so profoundly among uh, children of different groups. So now let me uh, fill in the other part of this convergence, which is uh, just a, a brief synopsis of uh, the work that I've been doing over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So my work uh, began with this uh, single most well-replicated finding in all of child health services research, which is that when you look at the distribution of morbidity and illness within childhood populations represented by this whole array of children here, you find that that distribution is highly non-random in character. It's very uneven. It's, it's uh, not distributed uh, evenly across the childhood population. And in fact, there is a subset of children, usually constituting about 15 to 20 percent uh, of kids, about one in five, represented by these darker green little figures, who are responsible for well over half of the biomedical and psychiatric morbidities within that population, and in addition, uh, utilize well over half of the health care uh, within that population. So a tremendous unevenness in the distribution of morbidity. Now the public health implications of that finding are obvious. If we could find something out about what's going on with these children, we would be potentially able to address uh, well over half of the morbidity, the illness, the chronic disease within that uh, population of kids. Well, it turns out that when you begin to study those children, those one in five who have this disproportionate rate of illness, it turns out that there are some of the same things that you've been hearing about all day that emerge. These are children who come primarily from lower SES uh, families. They are children who are in families that are uh, chaotic, who are experiencing major adversity in their lives. Uh, they come from uh, families that 
uh, have a great deal of chaos and mobility. Uh, so there's a lot of stress in the lives of these children who have this disproportionate uh, morbidity. So our work began by asking, why, why would this be? Why, why would there be all of the children within these populations have stressors and adversities in their lives, but why would there be this subgroup who have this tremendously increased uh, rate of morbidity? And the way that we began to address that question was to say, let's bring children into highly standardized, highly scripted situations that demand things of them that are challenging. Not so challenging that they run out of the room and go back to their mom, but things that are, that are challenging at the emotional level, interpersonal level, cognitively. So we brought children into these circumstances, put them in front of a previously unknown, unknown examiner, and asked them to do a series of ecologically valid but challenging, uh, mildly stressful tasks. And while we did that, we indexed uh, two of the principal uh, brain uh, uh, circuitries uh, for, that are responsible for stress response. <clears throat> and those are uh, the, the corticotropin releasing hormone system, which uh, is centered here in the hypothalamus, which is responsible for communicating with the pituitary, the release of ACTH, and the secretion of cortisol, which of course has profound effects on blood pressure, glucose regulation, and so on. The other system is the one that is centered in this little uh, uh, nucleus here in the brainstem called the locus ceruleus, which through dopaminergic pro uh, projections up to the hypothalamus ignites the whole fight or flight response that we're all familiar with. The dilating of our eyes, the tremulousness of our hands, the sweaty uh, palms that we've all experienced under conditions of duress um, and challenge. Now what we found in study after study, really, was that when we looked at uh, the distribution, the frequency distribution of responses within these two systems. This one happens to show uh, pre-ejection period, which is a measure of the sympathetic uh, branch of the autonomic nervous system. You can see that there is a broad uh, a distribution, uh, also uh, very normal in, in uh, character, uh, with some children at the very high end, some children at the very low end, and many, many children in the middle. These are the children that we became acutely interested in because of what happened to those children when we then looked at their outcomes in epidemiologic uh, study designs. So let me show you that. I'm gonna show you one representative finding from one of what's now probably 15 to 20 uh, findings of this kind uh, that we've been able to uh, uh, accumulate over the last couple of decades of work. So this was uh, work by one of uh, our postdoctoral fellows, actually a global scholar within CIFAR, Yelena Obradovich, who's now an assistant professor at Stanford. Uh, she was looking at the rate of external, externalizing behavior problems among children from families with low versus high marital conflict. And she, via this lab uh, uh, procedure, divided that sample of children into those with low autonomic nervous system reactivity and those with high autonomic nervous system reactivity, the high being the ones in that little uh, red circle on the previous graph. So here's what we find over and over again. We find that the children, the 80, 85% of kids within our uh, laboratory uh, that have low uh, autonomic or adrenocortical reactivity basically have very little increase in uh, behavior problems and other forms of, uh, of, of morbidity within childhood uh, under conditions of high marital stress. It's almost as if they're kind of indifferent to whether their parents are fighting or not. By contrast to that, the children who were these kids who had this extreme reactivity in the laboratory uh, setting uh, had a very different pattern. They had the highest rates of behavior problems and other uh, maladaptive outcomes under conditions of high marital uh, conflict. But when they were being raised in families with low marital conflict, something that we hadn't expected uh, showed up, which was that these kids didn't just come back to kind of normal levels of their 
of their peers in the 80% who were low in reactivity, but they actually went past them and had the lowest rates of morbidity of any of the children uh, in the sample. So over and over again, we have found these uh, findings where we see that the high reactivity children have either the worst of outcomes or the best of outcomes, depending upon the character of the social environment in which they find themselves uh, being reared. Now, our interpretation of this has been that this represents a kind of differential neurobiological susceptibility to social context. We have, as you've heard, uh, used uh, a kind of shorthand for this, referring uh, to the kids in the 80% with low reactivity and these kind of indifferent responses to psychosocial stressors, uh, using the Swedish uh, idiomatic expression maskrosbarn, which means dandelion child. And the Swedes literally mean by this a kid like a dandelion who will grow almost wherever you want to plant, plant that child. And we coined this, uh, you know, Swedish neologism, <clears throat> or kita barn, or orchid child, to describe the kids who, like the orchid, have, can have extraordinarily wonderful outcomes, but are highly dependent, dependent upon the character, uh, the nuanced character of the social environment in which they are being reared. So we began to think about these as uh, orchid and dandelion children. Now, we have uh, now replicated these kind of findings using uh, genetic means of, of separating children rather than laboratory measures of stress reactivity. This is work by uh, Nikki Bush uh, and Nancy Adler and I at UCSF. Uh, it shows, uh, sorry, it shows the uh, fall chronic uh, daily cortisol level, the level of stress that children are experiencing in school as a function of low versus high family income, basically a measure of socioeconomic status. And here you see the same phenomenon that children who had a brain-derived neurotrophic factor uh, polymorphism that resulted in a valine to methionine uh, amino acid uh, substitution, uh, they had either uh, the worst outcomes, the highest cortisol secretion, or uh, the lowest outcomes. So here again, uh, the dandelion uh, and uh, the orchid. And in fact, over the last several years, we have accumulated findings at a whole variety of different biological levels, differing uh, tremendously in scale and complexity that range from uh, chromatin modification by epigenetic marks through uh, G by E interactions like the one I showed you uh, from uh, Nikki Bush, uh, through the CRH and locus ceruleus norepinephrine systems that I originally started with, through behavior uh, and temperament, the work of Jay Belsky, and on up into the, uh, the human uh, metagenome. So at every level that we've had a chance to look at, us and others, we have found evidence for this kind of crossover interaction that is so interesting to us in differentiating kids who differ in their sensitivity to social context and social adversity. Oh, and I just wanted to show you, the last time I talked about this, a woman came up, came rushing up afterwards and said, I was born in the former Czechoslovakia, and I, uh, I survived, and I thrived, and I'm now here in Canada, and I'm strong, and in fact, I am a dandelion child, and then she showed me her foot, which, <laughs> which shows a dandelion and carpe diem t tattooed on her, on her foot. <laughs> So Clyde's work, which began with this uh, focus on uh, the environment, uh, the, the, really the physical environment of these blighted societies in Eastern Europe, and moved uh, quickly into uh, a focus on uh, childhood, uh, converged then with my work on uh, children within social groups and the uh, discernment of these orchid and dandelion uh, children. The convergence resulted for Clyde and me in this synthesis. It was a proposal that maybe children are actually the differentially susceptible demographic subgroup within human populations. If we think about this not at the individual level like I tend to think about it, but rather at the population level like Clyde tends to think about it, maybe children are in fact the analogs 
of the dandelion children within my samples of school age uh, children. Maybe the childhood population actually functions as the orchids within uh, broader human populations. Now the implications of that, if there were evidence for it, would be, would be big because it would mean that these children are going to be sensitive not only to uh, noxious, toxic environments, but they would also be more sensitive to positive, encouraging, nurturant environments. And the policy implications of that kind of a shift that we see with those dandelion children that go from the, the worst outcomes to the best outcomes, just depending upon the kind of uh, social environment in which they find themselves, is a big uh, shift. So let, w I'm asking you to think with me for just a moment now about uh, three different aspects of this hypothesis, that, that children are in fact uh, the differentially susceptible demographic subgroup within human populations. Let's think together about the biological plausibility of that hypothesis, a bit about what epidemiologic evidence there might exist, and finally a little bit about the implications for human societies if that turned out to be uh, a valid hypothesis. So we'll start now with, the, with biological plausibility. What we would need to show to uh, provide some evidence for biological plausibility would be at least two kinds of phenomena. One would be uh, that there would be biological sources of plasticity and susceptibility within the lives of children that are unusual relative to those of older uh, adolescents and adults. And secondly, that there might be increased exposures among uh, children relative to uh, adults and older uh, individuals. So one, one source of biological plausibility is this tremendous neuronal and brain circuitry development uh, that is a source of plasticity. This just shows uh, the same little guy over uh, several months of time and shows the corresponding changes in cortical neurons and synapse developments uh, that are happening over this same period of time. You've heard uh, throughout the day, especially early in the morning, about these huge changes that are happening in the, the infant brain. Uh, there is this exuberant uh, profusion of the development of neurons and connections, synapses between neurons, uh, followed by a, a pruning back and a selection of those uh, synapses and neurons uh, over time. This is a, a huge source of plasticity in the early life of young children. Secondly, you've also heard about uh, gene environment interplay as a source of plasticity. And we know, and as you heard from uh, Marla's talk, that uh, DNA is not just uh, DNA in a DNA double helix. It is, in fact, if you uncoil it from the chromosome, is uh, like beads on a string. The DNA is wrapped around these uh, histone proteins that together form a nucleosome, and the tightness or the looseness of that structure disallows or allows the transcription of that uh, DNA. So we have both in the epigenome all of these different chemical tags, DNA methylation, uh, the histone proteins can be acetylated, methylated, and so on. So there are these epigenomic sources of variation. And there, are, there is transcriptional regulation that happens at the genomic level as well in the form of single nucleotide polymorphisms, splice variants, microRNAs, and so on. And together, these two can alter gene expression, which in turn alters behavior, development, and risk, which in turn is responsible for these beautiful and amazing differences in phenotype that we see among uh, human children, both in terms of physical phenotype, but also in terms of character of, of risk, uh, their liabilities, their strengths, and so on. The other uh, aspect of biological plausibility is whether there might be greater environmental exposures uh, among children. And we do know that when we look at the mean uh, water intake, for example, at per, at on a per kilo uh, basis as a function of uh, age, we find that there is this uh, tremendous increase in per kilo water consumption uh, among uh, young children. Infants drink seven times as much water as the average adult. Uh, 
And we know as well that uh, young children are famous for having this kind of impermeable relationship with the physical environment. There's lots of eating dirt and worms and uh, stuff like that. Um, we also know that as children uh, grow, that they encounter uh, much more deeply and complexly uh, the, uh, the, the social environment in which they, uh, uh, in which they live. So uh, as children go from infants to toddlers on through into uh, preschool age and into primary school, there is this huge profusion of contact uh, with uh, the social environment. So tremendously greater increases in exposures to both the physical environment and the social environment. So let's go on now to epidemiologic evidence. If you think with me about this for just a moment, what would we need to see to have epidemiologic evidence for uh, this hypothesis? Well, first we would want to see uh, that there are environmental exposures involving both children and adults. It's remarkable how few uh, studies there are out there that look at uh, either an intervention or some other form of environmental exposure in both children and adults and measure the same outcome. But that is one criterion for evaluating uh, this hypothesis. The second is that we should show increased risk under conditions of threat. The, the dandelion children within our subsamples show this kind of phenomenon of increased risk under conditions of threat. But thirdly, there should also be evidence of diminished risk under condition, conditions of protection. This is not good enough by itself. This has to be there as well. So let me offer you just uh, four snapshots of epidemiologic evidence that this may, in fact, uh, be true. First of all, um, if we look, sadly, at the leukemia incidence by age at the atomic bomb exposures in Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki, uh, Japan. Uh, the Hiroshima individuals shown in the black and the Nagasaki individuals shown in the hatched uh, parts of this graph. This shows uh, the years after exposure, so this is the time of the atomic uh, exposure. This is time going forward, and this is, on this axis, the age at the time uh, of the uh, atomic uh, bomb explosion. And then on the third axis coming out of the, out of the uh, surface here is uh, excess risk uh, in uh, the high-dose group. And what you can see is that the highest and earliest risk of leukemia uh, is among exposed children. So here was a uniform exposure within these two uh, cities in Japan, uh, clear evidence that children were the more susceptible to the development of leukemia in the period following uh, the exposure. Secondly, uh, Sheldon Cohen's work, um, fascinating work where he looks at childhood social conditions, uh, then looks at uh, young adults, inoculates them in the nose with a rhinovirus, and looks to see whether they develop an infection or not. And his work has nicely shown that, that the number of years parents have owned their home as a measure of socioeconomic status is a predictor of the percentage of individuals who became infected with the uh, rhinovirus introduced uh, into their nose. So those who had long-term ownership of their homes had much less in the way of infection uh, than those who had very brief periods of home ownership. But more important to uh, this argument is that when he looks at the adjusted effect sizes for associations between parental home ownership and adult susceptibility to respiratory infection, this is a graded association with the most powerful effect sizes among those who are young in age relative to those who are older in age and heading into adolescence. So again, another uh, piece of evidence for increased risk under conditions of threat. Now, we need to show diminished risk under conditions of protection as well. So here is an example of uh, looking at caries, dental caries prevalences in communities with fluoridated versus unfluoridated water in Australia, UK, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, and the US. And the vertical axis here shows the percent reduction in caries uh, prevalence by uh, age. And what these data show very clearly is that the highest effect sizes are among the very young, and this diminishes over time. So here's an example of the protection uh, of oral health uh, 
by fluoridating the community water that is greatest in the young and, and more minimal in the old. And finally, uh, here is an experiment. This is the, uh, the moving to opportunity experiment that occurred in five U.S. cities. Uh, the effect of these uh, interventions on anxiety and depression in parents uh, and children. Uh, it was a three-part, a three-arm experiment. There was a control group that basically got nothing. There was a group uh, that had housing vouchers so that they were able to move if they uh, felt that they needed to. And then there was an experimental group that was actively encouraged to move and, and facilitated the move to neighborhoods that would be moves up in terms of socioeconomic uh, status uh, and, and mobility. And what you can see here is that when you compare the effect on children relative to the effect on parents, that both the housing voucher only group and the experimental group showed greater effects in the children than it did uh, on the parents. So the greatest benefits of both the experimental and the housing voucher interventions were uh, greatest in children. So finally, what are the implications for human societies? Well, I think the implication is what we've been hearing about all day, that societies have an obligation, a moral obligation, uh, an imperative to provide a singular attentiveness to the welfare uh, of children. Uh, we are not doing that, and this is uh, similar to some of the uh, slides that you've seen earlier today. This is from uh, the OECD, uh, a report called Doing Better for Our Children. It shows the percentage of children living in poor households. And here are Canada and the United States. <clears throat> uh, very high uh, prevalence rates of poverty within, within childhood. <clears throat> Uh, this is a report from uh, UNICEF on child well-being in rich countries. They looked at various aspects of children's relationships, the family structure, things such as the percentage of children uh, living in single-parent homes, family relationships, uh, the proportion of children who uh, report that their parents spend time just talking to them, peer relationships, percentage of 11, 13, and 15-year-olds who report uh, their peers as kind and helpful. Uh, and again, here we find this is a standardized score uh, above and below the median, and here we find Canada and the United States down in the uh, very low reaches of child uh, relational well-being. Finally, uh, we might think that we would reward, provide greater remuneration and reward for those serving the youngest of children because of this phenomenon. This is an approximation of the growth in size and complexity of the brain over these first uh, few years of life through adolescence. You can see that by about the age of nine, in terms of uh, size and complexity, the brain uh, has probably reached uh, its uh, zenith. And you would think that because of this, because of this intensive brain growth uh, during this early period of life, that this would be the period where we would want to place the greatest investment and the greatest uh, amount of uh, remuneration. And of course, as you well know, uh, it is just uh, the opposite of that. Uh, what we find is that uh, preschool teachers make hardly anything kindergarten teachers a little more, and so on, up the scale uh, to university professors. I'm not advocating uh, the, uh, <laughs> go on record saying, I'm not advocating a, a transfer of salaries here, but uh, you would think that we would at least, as societies, establish a parity between those who are teaching our youngest and most uh, plastic and, and vulnerable and uh, and uh, susceptible uh, young people uh, in this uh, 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 age range. It's particularly compelling, this graph, in light of uh, the, the findings of Raj Chetty, an economist at Harvard, who found that if you look at the 20 children who have either a really great kindergarten teacher or uh, you know, a kind of blah average kindergarten teacher, that the, the, the increase in uh, value to society of having 20 children receive a good kindergarten teacher for uh, the one year of kindergarten is about $132,000 a year. And I can guarantee you there are no kindergarten teachers in North America who are uh, making that, but maybe they should. 
So I will end here, and I, I want to tell you just a very brief story. Uh, Max Dupree, uh, who is a business leader and author of several books on leadership, uh, wrote in his book, Leadership is an Art, about his granddaughter Zoe, who was born prematurely, weighing just one pound. The neonatologist who initially saw Zoe said that she had about a 5 to 10 percent chance of living three days. She was in a neonatal ICU with multiple tubes and monitors when Dupree and his wife came for a first visit. To complicate matters further, Zoe's father had jumped ship the month before she was born. Realizing this, a very wise neonatal nurse took the grandfather aside and gave him his, his instructions, which were as follows. For the next several months, at least, you are the surrogate father. I want you to come to the hospital every day to visit Zoe. And when you come, I would like you to rub her body and her legs and arms with the tip of your finger. And while you're caressing her, you should tell her over and over again how much you love her, because she has to be able to connect your voice to your touch. I think that what made Clyde such a brilliant and memorable leader was his remarkable capacity for connecting voice and touch. He was able somehow to link his heartfelt and outspoken passion for better, more just societies with his ways of being and doing in the world, both professionally and personally. He was an extraordinary synthesis of heart, voice, touch, and action, and his devotion to children's lives will not soon be forgotten by any of us. Thank you.